Tom, um, thank you very much for that nice introduction. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here behind the Senate. What I'd like to talk to you about is, in fact, the climate negotiations and the fact that uh, by 2020, we should have a new climate treaty in place. Now, to figure out where we need to be in 2020, we need to uh, take into consideration two very important developments already in the climate negotiations. First of all, the fact that for the very first time, countries have agreed to a climate target. This is itself a momentous development, in my opinion. That we've agreed to limit the increase in global temperature, global average temperature, to two degrees in the century. And secondly, countries have also agreed on a means to get there by making a variety of pledges to either control or reduce emissions by 2020. So these developments lead to two other important questions. First of all, is where we're aiming, that is, relative to the two degree target, consistent with where we're headed if you were to implement these pledges? Or is, in fact, there a gap in global emissions that we would need to close? And if we need to close it, how shall we do that? Now, to address these questions, UNEP convened uh, scientists from over 40 institutions and uh, put out a series of reports over the last couple of years called the Emissions Gap Reports. And this diagram summarizes some of the key findings of the scientists. This comes from our last year's report. And that gray cascade, that upper gray cascade, shows a set of 39 emission pathways from 10 different studies, very different studies, compiled by these scientists. What these pathways have in common is that they all comply with the two degree target. So here, the vertical axis are global emissions, total greenhouse gas emissions. And the horizontal axis are years from 2000 to 2100. So what does this curve tell us about where we're headed, where we need to be? First of all, it tells us that we're at around 49 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions. And it tells us that pretty much according to these scientific studies, they all consistently say that we need to peak around 2020 or before. And by 2030, we need to be about a quarter below current levels of emissions. And by 2050, more than 50% below current levels. Now, since these pledges are pegged to 2020, then it's a more interesting question where we're going to stand in 2020 if the pledges are complied with versus where we need to be on the two degree target. So we're going to hone in now on that window in the upper left there. And this is a piece of the curve that I just showed you, only now it's the piece of the curve from 2010 to 2020. Again, we're at around 49 gigatons. Now, if you look in 2020, it's a big range of uncertainty of the pathways that are consistent with two degrees. But an intermediate value is around 44. So we might be heading as an intermediate value <coughs> towards 44 if we want to stay on the pathway to complying with our own climate targets. But now we're at 49, we're already more than 10% above this target. So that's what we're aiming for. Now the question is, where are we headed if we were to implement these pledges. Now, it's not so straightforward exactly where we'll be, because there's different ways of interpreting the pledges, because the rules around their implementation are pretty complicated. And also, some countries have uh, given conditional pledges. If everyone else uh, plays along, then the EU will reduce not 20% by 2020, but 30%, as an example. So we get a range of where we're headed. So where are we headed? The scientists concluded that we're not headed at all towards 44, but in fact in the opposite direction, such that there's a big gap between those upper curves there and this 44 value, an intermediate value, which would be consistent with the two degree target. There's a lot of numbers and arrows there, so let me summarize it for you. If we weren't to implement the pledges at all, so as a reference case, under business as usual, we would have in 2020 a gap of 14 gigatons per year. If we were to implement the pledges in different ways, we would get something between 52 and 58 gigatons in 2020. And now if you subtract the 44, you can do the math, you get between 8 and 13 gigatons per year as a gap between the 44 gigatons, which are consistent with our two degree target, and where we're headed. Under the most ambitious case, we've got 8 gigatons per year as a gap. And that's a big number. If you add up all of the emissions from all of the industries in the world and all of the greenhouse gases, 
get 8 gigatons per year. So it looks like the pledges are not going to be enough to meet the 2 degree target, the rate would go. And there's a big gap to close in 2020. Now, and I'll finish with the bad news. What if we miss this target? What if we don't close the gap? Is the world going to end? Well, I, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe it will. But the best estimate is that at least it will be warmer. We expect that we would then be on a trajectory not to 2 degrees anymore, but somewhere between 2.5 and, and 5, depending on the emissions <coughs> leading up to 2020 and after 2020. Will be the long term uh, temperature increase that we would expect, which also translates into more frequent and more intense droughts, floods, coastal floods, river floods, heat waves, and other climate impacts. Now, I'm getting tired of the bad news myself, so now it's time for some good news. So, the same scientists that worked on the emissions gap report asked themselves the question how can we close the gap? And they looked for opportunities in all the world's economic sectors and did an analysis of what the potential was, the economic potential at any rate would be, to reduce emissions in 2020 relative to a baseline. And they found there were great opportunities. In fact, they found that it added up to a big number, 17 gigatons per year. And if you remember that other set of numbers I showed you, the largest number of the gap was 14. So it looks like that in principle, technically and even economically, it is possible to close the gap in 2020. More good news is that a lot of policies going on on the ground are beginning to realize this potential. In transportation, more than 16 countries have implemented bus rapid transit systems in getting people out of cars, to, say, to a certain extent anyway, and into buses, and leading to a more energy efficient transportation system. For Mexico City, they've estimated that they're avoiding around 140,000 tons per year each year by having their bus rapid transit system as opposed to not having it. And the United States and many other countries have implemented vehicle performance standards that are beginning to reduce emissions. In the building sector, more than 75 countries have implemented at least partial appliance standards, bringing into use in their economies more efficient refrigerators and dishwashers, etc. Even in developing countries, this has had a big effect on household energy use in the middle class. And it's added up. In fact, calculations are showing that if these appliance standards are applied broadly across the world, that they have the potential to reduce by around a gigaton per year greenhouse gas emissions by 2020 relative to a baseline. And in the forestry sector, actions are being taken to reduce emissions around the world in the forestry sector from deforestation. Brazil and Costa Rica have uh, expanded their protected areas, slowing down the rate of deforestation. Brazil's implemented a fairly successful effort to monitor deforestation at the margin through satellite monitoring and other methods. And so that these packages of policies are beginning to bring down emissions from deforestation in developing countries and around the world. But the important point is that it looks like these policies are achieving emission reductions, but in fact they're not being implemented to reduce greenhouse gas emission reductions. In fact, transportation policies are largely oriented towards reducing traffic congestion, reducing air pollution. At the same time, appliance standards are reducing energy costs and energy use also in poorer countries. And uh, policies targeted against deforestation are meant to protect indigenous cultures and also conserve the economic values of the forests themselves. But in fact, they are leading to reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. So pursuing national and local benefits look like, in fact, they can lead to substantial reductions even in the short term of greenhouse gas emissions. But while I'm talking to you and while we're discussing these different policies, they're not happening fast enough. We are locking in high emissions all around the world because we're still manufacturing energy inefficient vehicles. And these vehicles are still going to be on the road in 2020 when we have to close the gap. And we're still investing in power plants that don't have the maximum kind of combustion efficiency. And they're going to be around for decades. And we're constructing energy wasteful buildings. And these buildings are going to be around for 100 years, probably. We're locking ourselves, while we're sitting here talking about it, into high emissions. We need to act, and we need to act quickly. 
So if I can sum up, the scientists are telling us that it looks like in order to stay on this two degree target, which we, which the countries of the world have agreed to, it looks like emissions need to peak before 2020. But it turns out current emissions are, are already more than 10% of the 2020 emission levels consistent with this two degree target. And they're still growing. And if you add up all the country pledges that are on the table right now in the negotiations, it doesn't look like they're enough. There'll still be a gap of around 8 to 13 gigatons per year. <clears throat> but the good news is that the gap can be narrowed, it looks like technically, and with action in the negotiations. That is, if the countries insist on strict rules for complying with these pledges, and if countries pursue more ambitious pledges. And it looks like also that the gap, in fact, can be bridged, because there is a large potential in each sector to reduce emissions. And if you add up the potential, it adds up to 17, which is greater than the biggest estimate of the gap. And it can be, in fact, realized by scaling up packages of policies that, in fact, fulfill local and national self-interest, not necessarily climate policies. So, in fact, it looks that we can, in fact, close the gap, that it is feasible, but it's also going to take action, and it's going to take action immediately. Thank you very much.